Ah, child's play. Annabelle. Even I, Robot. What do all these movies have in common, do you think? Well, they all play on the fear of inanimate figures designed to represent humans. Whether it's the eternally smiling dummy of a ventriloquist, or the anthropomorphized Chuck E. Cheese animatronic, we all find them so unnerving, don't we? Well, that's definitely the case in tonight's story, another from the marvellous Dopamine. Always a pleasure to read her stories, and I have got a fantastic one for you lined up this evening. Well, my dear friends, it's been a long week, but here we are on a Friday. So, it's time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. Patient name, Spitzer, Jonathan. Age, 98. Sex, male. Diagnosis, automatonophobia, the fear of human-like figures. Following a credible lead from Redacted, the Skinner Foundation reviewed the following text, retrieved from 4chan on the 8th of January 2013. Due to extreme similarities with the failed project at Redacted, the Foundation elected to locate the author of the 4chan text in an effort to determine whether the post was a joke, whether the poster was an overlooked and unintended victim of the project, or whether the project had in fact perpetuated without the Foundation's knowledge or oversight. Agent 8 identified the subject per Foundation protocol, and located him on the upper floor of the abandoned premises of… Redacted. Estate specialists a business owned by the subject before its closure in 1978. As per Agent 8's report, the subject appeared to be approximately 30 years of age, with notably smooth skin and extremely dark eyes. Remarkably, the subject knew the agent had come to discuss the incident outlined in his 4chan post. He told Agent 8, I can't help you. I've tried everything. I can't touch it. I can't look at it or anything like it. No animatronics, no robots, not even mannequins. I can't go shopping. I can't leave the building. I can't even look at myself in the mirror because I look like them. Like what, Mr. Spitzer? The automatons, Mr. Spitzer replied. I can't help you. I'm sorry. Whatever you want me to do, I can't. Agent 8 assured the patient that she did not expect help from the subject. Rather, she came to provide the subject with help. The subject began to weep upon this pronouncement, and voluntarily surrendered himself to the Foundation custody. Below is the patient's original post. In March 1963, I handle the liquidation of a decrepit theme park owned by a man named Dylan Rendhart. You wouldn't know the name of the park. It's the type of place you forget as soon as you see it. No one cared when it was new, and no one noticed when it closed two years prior to my arrival. The park occupied a vast stretch of worthless desert. A single roller coaster twisted up from the sage choked sand like the bones of a giant. Dilapidated shops and restaurants lined the buckled streets. I spent the day meticulously documenting anything that might be an asset. Sand-caked fryers, wind-blasted ovens, cases of merchandise. I opened one box of stuffed animals, only to have a cascade of cockroaches spill up and over the floor. I even photographed the roller coaster in case the metal was salvageable. I could almost see the park as it should have been. Bustling and clean, perhaps never crowded, but at least populated with clusters of curious tourists. But what surrounded me now could have been a ghost town, or the aftermath of an atomic bomb. Around five in the evening, I took shelter in a dusty shop. Dry heat spilled over me like a tide. I uncapped my sixth water bottle of the day and drained it. It was too hot to even think of eating. So, I sat there feeling hollow and vaguely sick, as the sun sank and deep brown shadows spread across the floor. 
the water slowly worked its magic, washing away the fugue and injecting cold energy into my veins. And so, I picked up my camera. When I turned around, I saw people standing in the shadows. They weren't right. I couldn't pinpoint why, but looking at them caused a surge of panic. Hello? I said timidly. No one moved. Strange eyes glimmered. This is private property. I licked my lips. Does Mr. Rendhurt know you're here? No response. Anger gnawed the edges of my fear. <laughs> Excuse me, you shouldn't be here. I squared my shoulders and marched forward. The people came into focus. And finally, I realized they weren't people. They were automatons. Robots made to look like humans. The kind you now see at Disneyland in Pirates of the Caribbean, or in that building where you could talk to robotic figures of the presidents. I reared back, revulsion clashing with panic. I guess you could say I was phobic, for I'd always hated these things. Hated them. Wax museums, mannequins, mechanical dolls, any artificial thing created to look and act like a human being. There weren't any presidents in that park. No, it was a disconcerting mix of mundane people, celebrities and humanoid characters. All of them were hideous. Without Disney's money or talent, automatons are scarier than you can imagine. I took dozens of photos, making sure to document every figure. Many were missing, well, things. Fingers, toes, eyes, noses. I quell the horror churning in my guts. These were assets. I was here to document assets. My feelings, my phobia, didn't matter. So, I set up my light kit and took some pictures. The flash blazed off a dozen golden orbs. That's when I noticed that each figure was holding something in their left hands. Apple. Burnished, golden apples, gleaming in the dying light, all except the last one. A nightmarish and inexpert replica of Frank Sinatra, which held an egg. I shuddered and walked into the back room. The roof was full of holes, peppering the area with rays of golden sunset. Surprisingly, it was otherwise pristine. No boxes, no garbage, no machinery, just a smooth wooden floor, and in the center, seven apple trees. I drew closer. No delicious reds or granny greens here. These were a smooth, preternaturally bright gold. For the first time in hours, my stomach rumbled. I set the camera down and plucked an apple. It was glorious. Maybe it was the heat, or my anxiety, or the fact that I hadn't eaten anything all day. Or maybe it really was the apple itself. In any case, that apple was the most delicious thing I've ever tasted. I wolfed it down, and then ate another, then another, and another, and another, and another, until I thought my stomach would explode. I felt wonderful. Nourished, wide awake, excited, and fearless. Smiling, I plucked a seventh apple, turning it this way and that so it gleamed in the sun. Then I went back into the main room. The automatons waited, staring blindly out of the broken windows. Sagging rubber skin and crooked limbs cast strange shadows. Their eyes were the worst, though. Round, black and far too large, black domes, dreadfully out of place in their otherwise human faces. I took the egg from Frank Sinatra's hand and replaced it with the apple. <laughs> there you are. You aren't left out anymore. His round, dark eyes stared into my own. 
The dying sun glinted deep within, tiny sparks of fire. My bravery suddenly evaporated. My gut squirmed, and for an awful instant I thought my bowels would let loose. I closed my eyes until my heartbeat slowed and my belly settled. Then I returned to the back room for my camera. I looked at the apples again. Copper rays shining off the smooth golden skin, perfect leaves filtering and diffusing the light. I approached reverently. What I wouldn't give for one of those trees. While admiring the perfection of the bark, I saw something resting against the trunk. A blue notebook. Written on the cover in shaky block letters were the words, Please don't feed the robots. I heard a thump behind me. Thinking of coyotes, I whirled around and froze. Frank Sinatra was bent over the camera, as if caught in the act of picking it up. Bulbous black eyes glistened in the dying light. I charged forward before terror could paralyze me. I grabbed his head and pulled, fully expecting to yank off a mask. It popped and strained, separating at the shoulder, and the fragile skin split. And it started to bleed. Frank Sinatra blinked. The awful clattering click of his plastic eyelids made me shudder. His mouth fell open. It was wet and alive, full of pulsating purple tissues and startlingly pink tongue. The tongue rolled up with a series of wet pops, revealing a mass of chewed apple. And then he smiled. Horror like I'd never known, engulfed me. I ran. He chased me, the dry click of its eyelids and the electric wheeze of machinery made me nauseous. I ran for what felt like eternity, and then, just yards away from the entrance to the rusted roller coaster, I saw someone in the street. Help! I screamed. The figure turned languidly. The smoothness of the movement was very organic, very human, but there was weakness in it. The fragility that caused a thrill of horror. Oh, this person wouldn't be any help. Hell, they probably needed my help. I skidded to a halt. Frank Sinatra's telltale clatter and wheeze seemed distant. Half alive or not, the automaton couldn't keep up. I had time. The stranger was a hideously injured young man. A cascade of tangled dark hell fell past his shoulders. He had only a single eye, dark and wide as the eyes of the automatons. The other was lost in a rotted morass of wet flesh and gleaming bone. I quelled another surge of panic. Sir, we need to leave. I can't explain. I don't have time, but... You ate my apples, he breathed. His face split into a smile, bearing broken teeth. Thank God, you ate my apples. He rushed at me with extraordinary speed, closing the distance between us before I could take a step. As he moved, I heard the distinct squeal of inner machinery, shrill and metallic, but deeply muffled. I tried to run but horror paralyzed me. I couldn't even scream. He grabbed my hand reverently and caressed my fingers. Despite the machinery, I felt his pulse. Steady, strong, sure. Before I could make sense of this, he brought my index finger to his mouth and bit it off. The pain was exquisite. Meaty and glassy at once, Filthy and seemingly endless. It broke the spell. I bolted. He chased me. Unlike Frank Sinatra, he was fast. Bony fingers caught my shirt. He grabbed and scratched and skinned curls of flesh from my arms. But I kept running. 
He was fast, but he wasn't strong. Stars twinkled into existence, cutting the brilliant sunset sky with chips of ice. I saw the park entrance just as a stitch exploded in my sight. Beyond the collapsed sign and sun-bleached ticket booths, I saw my car. The stranger grabbed me again. I sprinted, crying as pain exploded in my abdomen. Stay here, he pleaded. I'll let you eat my apples. You'll live forever if you do. Then we can kill the robots and set things right. I slammed into my car. The stranger immediately slammed into me. I pushed him off. He fell into the sand and was prone just long enough for me to slot my key into the lock. Then he rushed forward and bit my arm. He tore and shook like a wild dog, separating flesh from bone. I threw him off again and unlocked the door. He collided with the door the second I slid into the car. What followed was a horrifying game of tug of war. Me trying to shut the door, him struggling to pull it open. Suddenly, he screamed and fell away. I pressed the lock as a figure shot up, tall and broad, with bulging black eyes and cracked, faded flesh. Frank Sinatra. He waved at me cheekily, then dropped under my line of sight. The stranger screamed shrilly as a ribbon of blood splattered my window. I sped away. In my rearview mirror, I saw a crowd of automatons converging on the stranger. I drove until I found a hospital. By the time I pulled into the parking lot, I was dizzy from blood loss. When I stumbled into the ER, people screamed. I don't remember much. I do remember waking up with a desperately painful urge to piss. I stood up and shuffled to the bathroom. I relieved myself. Then, stealing myself for the injuries I was about to see, went to the sink. To the mirror. A stranger stared back at me. I screamed and spun around, expecting to see the intruder. There was nothing. Just me. Just me, except wrong. The man in the mirror had my eyes, my face, my hair. I touched my cheek, and so did the reflection. I pulled my eyebrow, my lip, my ear, and so did he. I leaned forward, touching my forehead to the glass. So did he. There was no question. He was me. Except, he was young enough to be my son. At the time of this incident, I was 43 years old. The man, the boy, in the mirror, wasn't a day over 21. I told myself I was seeing things, a symptom, perhaps, of the painkillers. I crept out of the hospital shortly thereafter and went home. Collapsing in my own bed was a profound relief. That was what I needed. Familiarity, sense, normalcy. But when I woke up the next day, I looked even younger. I decided I was hallucinating and that I needed more sleep. And so I went back to bed and dreamed of golden apples. When I woke, I was seized with a single-minded fixation on the apples. Fear horror, automatons, none of it mattered. The only things that mattered were the apples. So, I returned to the theme park with a gun and a shovel. Near the entrance, I saw a corpse. Bloody ribs gleamed in the restless sun. A skinned, eyeless face stared blindly upward. I gave it a wide berth and entered the park. I found my camera where I'd left it, mere feet from the apples. The automatons were arranged neatly against the wall. Each had an apple. Some had blood on their faces and hands. Their sagging, rubbery skin was no more. Their flesh now looked plump and alive. 
I shot each automaton in the head, shuddering as blood dribbled from the wounds. Then I dug up the apple trees and carried them to my car, one by one. After a moment's hesitation, I went back one last time for the camera. I wish I hadn't. In my brief absence, the automatons had moved. They stood in a rough circle, frozen as if caught in conversation, mouths open, faces contorted, arms gesticulating. Their bullet holes were gone, replaced with red, raw flesh. I picked up the camera and ran back to the car. One final hideous surprise awaited me. That bloody, bony corpse. The stranger, that awful hybrid of a man and machine, so recently devoured by the automatons, had crawled to my car. Like the automatons, it had healed. Papery skin coated its ribs, and its one good eye had regenerated. The trees need me, it gurgled. I climbed into the car and drove away. In the rearview mirror, I saw it hauling itself to a sitting position. Its shoulders heaved as if it were weeping. I planted the trees in my yard, but despite my best efforts, they withered and began to die. I did everything I could for weeks. All the while, the stranger's voice echoed in my head. The trees need me. On Christmas Day, I returned to the park. The corpse, of course, was nowhere to be found. Of course not. He'd regenerated. I found the stranger by a support beam under the roller coaster. He turned slightly when I approached. The left side of his face was rotted as ever. I told you, he whispered. They need me. I brought him home, removed his limbs that were full of blood and bone and wires and circuits, and stuffed him in my dad's old locker. Then I buried him in the cellar. The trees did better but didn't flourish until I dug them up and planted them over the top of the locker. They don't need sunlight. They don't need water. They just need him. For the longest time, the stranger, a man who long ago owned the land the park was built on, whispered secrets. The eaters of the apples are connected somehow. When I eat, he benefits. I grow young, he grows whole. Once whole, he eventually grows young again too. He became part machine because of the automatons. He fed them the apples to see if the apples could give life to the lifeless. Well, they could. When the automatons started eating his apples, they took on his characteristics and he took on theirs. The apples reverse the aging process, heal injuries, even bring people back from the dead. Human flesh speeds up the process, as long as the human in question ingests apples first. After planting the apple trees in the cellar, I ate too many. I got too young, too strong, and so did he. After a few weeks, he burst out of the locker, I shot him in the head and removed his limbs again, and that's when he stopped talking to me for good. I eat far fewer apples than I used to. It keeps him damaged, and keeps me at a reasonable age. I look thirty now, give or take. But it's not enough for the stranger. He's no longer healthy enough to sustain the trees. They've been dying for years. I'm down to two trees now. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to find the line between keeping him alive and keeping him under control. I don't know if I want to find that line, because my life doesn't seem worth it anymore. You see, after that day at the park, my revulsion and fear of automatons metastasized into a fully-fledged phobia. Automatons, robots... Large dolls, 
animatronics, even mannequins. They all terrify me. And they're everywhere now. Everywhere. I can't even leave home anymore. The sight sends me into fully-fledged panic. The mere thought of them make me so afraid I feel sick. I don't know what to do. Death seems the easy option, but I'm afraid of death. Terrified of what waits for me beyond the veil. And, truth be told, I've eaten so many apples that I don't even know if I can die anymore. Following the patient's voluntary surrender, Agent Aid promptly searched his home. The agent located the following items of interest. A. One hard drive with a document relating to the patient's experiences, including the original text of the 4chan post. 108 photos of the park and its assets taken by the subject in April 1963. One young man with black hair and an extremely dark eye. One Springer Spaniel. Two fresh apples with a distinct golden hue. One shriveled apple with a distinct golden hue. Two living apple trees. Five dead apple trees. The document contained approximately 500,000 words of notes related to the patient's investigation of his experiences and is currently under review by Foundation personnel. Agent 8 recovered the young man in a steel locker hidden in the patient's cellar. Agent 8 noted that the figure's mouth was covered with duct tape. One eye had been removed. When Agent 8 removed the duct tape, she discovered a shriveled golden apple inside the young man's mouth. This further indicates the connection to the project at Redacted. Under the circumstances, the Foundation elected to euthanize the Spaniel. However, in the middle of the autopsy, the animal recovered from euthanasia and its incision spontaneously healed. The animal then bit the attending veterinarian. The veterinarian is currently under observation. The patient and the young man are in Foundation custody. At this time, the Foundation has decided to keep information regarding the young man's status from the patient until therapy concludes. What do you make of that one? Incredible, marvellous, fantastical, terrifying, creepy, scary, all the things I love in a good story. And um, it's always been a subject that's fascinated me, going back to um, the very, very old episodes of Doctor Who. I'm thinking really early 1970s. There's one where the automatons came alive and uh, terrorised London. And it was really creepy. Um, before my time, but something I definitely remember from uh, my early childhood. Anyway, that's enough for one week, isn't it? Of course, I'll be back next Monday and you're going to join me again, aren't you? Yes, you are. Until then, go have some fun. It's the weekend. But sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it, if you like, on SoundCloud. Drop by the store. Pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?